Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And aloha. Welcome to another edition of Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And for those of you who may not have seen the program before here, we talked about what's going on with the active uh, veterans and um, associated um, subjects anyhow. Uh, for every once in a while, I like to bring on veterans who have served our country in many different ways. And today I have two guests. Uh, one is Mr. Dan O'Leary and also Ms. Rona Adams, who will join us a little bit later in the program. Uh, but we like to bring them on to share their experiences and enlighten us to some of the things that have probably have happened in the past that you may not have been aware of. And uh, at this moment, I'd like to welcome Mr. O'Leary to the program. Glad to be here. Good. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I, um, I was born and raised in a small town in, uh, in New York, Mount Kisco, New York, mm -hmm. and uh, went to high school in White Plains, New York, and then went away to college at the University of Detroit. And uh, after two years at Detroit, I spent some time working uh, in a grocery store and then uh, went in the military. Mm. What made you decide to go in the military? Was there any family members that uh, preceded you? Mm, uh, there were family members in the military, but it was a matter of I was going to be drafted or I was going to join the military. So, right. so, I, so I joined rather than be drafted. And it worked out pretty well for me because my, uh, uh, I was in ROTC at the University of Detroit. So the Air Force uh, put me in a commissioning flying program. Wow. So I became a, uh, I was commissioned as a navigator uh, mm -hmm. and a second lieutenant in the Air Force Good. in 1960. Right. From the patch, I see that you're a member of the Vietnam Veterans of America. Uh, how long have you been with that organization and what are they about? Uh, just two years. Uh, we uh, uh, get together mostly to try and help other veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, uh, last week we had a graduation luncheon for, the, uh, for a PTSD class from, right. uh, from uh, Tripler mm -hmm. and uh, had the fellows seemed to have been done very well. We had a nice luncheon and they seemed to enjoy it. I don't know how long their program was, but yeah. it, uh, most of them were local from Hawaii. Right. Uh, there was one from Oregon, I think one from uh, California. Yeah, uh, with the PRRP program, that's the program you mentioned about um, individuals who have um, uh, issues associated with PTSD. All right. Um, some of the participants in the program, I know some of them are Vietnam era and all went up to the current um, conflicts that we, you know, we're uh, dealing with now anyhow. Uh, what is the attitude that you got from the individuals you talked to with the program? They, they were high on the program yeah. and, and seemed to uh, have come out of it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two Vietnam veterans out of the 12 that uh, were on the graduation lunch in there. Yeah. And uh, they, they seemed to have done real well too. And it's just too bad that they can't get more people in the program. A lot of people won't go in the program. Yeah. And I think it's still a, kind of a stigma when you out, you know, ask for help, you know. But I think, you know, when um, a few of the occasions I went to, you know, um, it's better to ask for the help. You know, I mean, it's it's something to be ordered in the combat. But when you turn around and on your own, you know, you know what um, the issues that you're, at, you're dealing with uh, have an effect on your family and the communities. And it takes a lot of courage for those individuals who go through the program to really, uh, you know, to appreciate, you know, their, I wouldn't say heroic act, but in a way I guess it is where, you know, they're concerned about uh, being, you know, more of a uh, contrib uh, con contributing to the community instead of a detractor in any way. Yeah. So, sure. yeah. Uh, so a little bit more about yourself. How many tours in Vietnam did you do? I did one uh, complete tour and then uh, I went into Vietnam many times. Uh, before that, I was with the uh, TAC Airborne Command Post. Our job was to uh, help ferry uh, fighter aircraft to Vietnam. Mm. And so I, I used to make sometimes as many as two, three trips a month to Vietnam uh -huh. uh, to bring the fighter aircraft over there. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, everybody talks about their experiences and experience different things in different ways. What is one of the, any major issues, like say, that you took away from being in that type of environment? Well, I, uh, I felt that you need to uh, have relaxation. You need to uh, have a little bit of enjoyment uh, each time. So we always had, uh, whenever we went out to, to fly, we would get back. We, our 
our, we would call ourselves a fly-by-night outfit. We always flew at night. We had black <laughs> airplanes. Yeah. And so we would come back at midnight, maybe one o'clock in the morning. We'd get our, uh, go down to the chow hall, eat, and then we would come back to our, uh, call it the hooch, our, our building. Yeah. And, uh, and we had, we had a, a refrigerator with beer and had a dart board and, and there would always be several of us there. And so we enjoyed ourselves for a little while before we went to bed. All right. And then sleep in in the morning. Of there you go. I know with the recently, well, with a lot of history, historical issues that have happened with the military, is there anything that you experienced or you were part of that is in the history books or that may not be there that should be there? Well, I was involved in the uh, ANLOC, uh, I don't know what you would call it, battle, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an army unit that was pinned down in a town called ANLOC in South Vietnam, and we were not supposed to fly in the daytime. But we uh, did in this occasion because uh, they needed us. So right. we went up there, and uh, the any aircraft was pretty bad. And the, out near the town, uh, from the I don't know who they were, South Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, so they uh, they were had pretty accurate anti-aircraft. So we had to figure out how to attack the enemy without in exposing the ourselves, because right. here we are in a black airplane in a clear sky, and. Uh, Nice, very easy to shoot at. Yeah. So we uh, we that worked out all right. We left and we debriefed everyone, told them what had gone on and what the situation was. The next aircraft went up there and got shot down. Wow! And uh, there, luckily, there were only three crew members that were killed yeah. uh, in the aircraft. The uh, the pilot uh, got the uh, 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 got a very very high decoration. The one right below the the uh, he had to, he had to fly the aircraft in. The aircraft would have just flipped over and gone down if he hadn't held on to it. The right. autopilot wouldn't wouldn't hold the airplane. Yeah. And so everybody got out except the navigator and one of the uh, crew members in the back who apparently was afraid to jump. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's rough. Um, I know that in the military you make a lot of uh, friends, acquaintances. Is there anybody that you've been in touch with? I know that uh, Rona, who of course will be on the program soon. Um, did you meet her in Vietnam or? No, I met her here. Here, okay, good. Um, is there any, are you still keep in touch with any of your old flying buddies or? Well, I went to a reunion last year. I didn't realize that there was a, uh, an association of uh, gunship mm -hmm. crew members. Uh, and I, so I joined the association. They had a reunion, they have a reunion each year now. Yeah. And I went last year, my wife and I went uh, to Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so it was nice to, I really didn't see anybody that I knew because there were thousands of us that, right. that flew gunships in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but uh, it was nice to, to meet and talk with the people that had gone through the same experience that I had. And, and uh, I'm sure it helped them as well as it helped me. Uh, it was about, a, it was a four day uh, affair. We also had a, uh, a banquet at the, uh, at the museum, the Air Force Museum at uh, yeah. Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah. Uh, speaking of museums, I guess you've been to the museum over on Ford Island? Oh yes. Yeah. Do you have any association with them in any form no, of capacity? No, I, I haven't. I've, I've gone out there a couple of times, taking, taking, you know, tourists out there that needed somebody to take them around. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what other? I know that uh, now it's more. A lot of veterans have been helping one another. But what are some of the organizations? Are are you in, in, involved in anything right now that helps other veterans or you know the community? Well, just uh, just this one, the Vietnam Veterans Association, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, do as much as we can. We uh, I took a, a small group. I'm in charge of the uh, visiting uh, veterans in the hospital. So we went up to the not it's not exactly a hospital, but it's a, a facility at uh, Tripler on the grounds of Tripler, mm -hmm. and uh, it's for veterans. And uh, three of us went up there, and uh, the woman that's ha not in charge, she's the second in charge there. She took us around and we visited a bunch of the veterans. Uh, we, uh, you know, visited them one on one. Sometimes all four of us would be in one of the rooms and it was, it was very interesting. And uh, one fellow told me that uh, when he got back from Vietnam, I'd heard that a lot of the uh, fellows had trouble uh, with, with the local population. But this yeah. guy, he got to his hometown and he met some of his buddies and they said, hey, let's go down to the VFW yeah. and we'll get a beer. So they went down to the VFW and they found out he was a Vietnam veteran. They kicked him out. Mm. So the Vietnam veterans really, really got a bad shake, yeah. uh, even from other veterans. So mm. there, were, there were, you know, I don't, 
I, I guess it was just all the bad publicity about Vietnam. Yeah, but that's kind of shameful and hurtful too, you know, when you serve your country and then there's certain individuals who serve in different branches at different times that want to make that distinction between who was a real soldier and who wasn't and, you know, all these experiences. But, um, you know, it seems that, of course, there's still a lot of issues that need to be dealt with, but it seems like there's more people who are willing to go ahead and, you know, they're giving the, the veterans their due. I mean, of course, with the uh, President Trump had um, designated, uh, I think, March 29th as the Vietnam Veterans Appreciation Day or whatever. Um, but um, there's still a lot of people out there that still are deserving of a, you know, a real welcome home and you know, appreciation because so many you know, have fallen by the wayside and it's really sad what happened in here. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of the things that your group right now with the Vietnam veterans, are you, uh, is there anything special that you're working on right now? Any type of uh, community activities that um, would be uh, of note? Not at this time. Mm -hmm. As I say, we did that one thing with the, the, this past weekend with the PTSD group. Uh, we don't have any other uh, specific things that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, we do, we do have a group that visits uh, veterans in the hospitals. And uh, we, it's funny, we, so we, had, we had organized the group, and about two weeks later, I got a call from Queens. <laughs> and they said, oh, we understand you're visiting veterans. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. so they said, well, we got a veteran in the hospital here. So they said, yeah. we'll talk to her and see if she wants somebody to visit. Well, she didn't want it, us to visit. So that was the end of that. But yeah. uh, so now we have a contact to Queens and, mm -hmm. and we haven't done a lot of it, but we have we have started it and we're going to continue. It's one of the things in our in our charter that we're yeah. supposed to visit veterans in the hospitals and nursing facilities, et cetera. Uh, with your group, I'm quite sure they're always looking for new members to come on board. Uh, is there anything that you can do to, or say, to encourage somebody that may be a Vietnam veteran who hasn't been involved with any organizations for whatever reason and might want to come in, you know, to be part of something that might be um, a little bit more uh, interactive with the other veterans? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, we meet once a month. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lunch. Uh, at the beginning of our meeting, so they ask us to show up about a quarter to 11, get our lunch, they have a buffet, mm -hmm. and uh, we sit down and eat lunch during the, during the meeting. Right. And um, it, we interact with each other. A lot of times we go around, introduce uh, ourselves to other veterans before mm -hmm. the meeting. Um, all services, all ranks, uh, we all, we all, we're all together, we're all, we're, we're all in the same boat, and yep. now we're all in the same boat again. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a good experience to, to get together with other veterans yep. as often. It's too bad uh, more people aren't involved. We have about 150 members, including associates. Yep. And the associates are uh, family uh, or just people who want to join the organization and be a part of it. Right. Okay. Well, we talk about the healing process of people who've been experienced, the, had the combat experience. Uh, have you been back to Vietnam or have you been any, any any part of any countries that you served in that you uh, have revisited? Yeah, I was on a, a cruise and we went uh, into a port south of uh, Saigon and then we took a bus up to Saigon. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't spent any time in Saigon. I was at Da Nang. Uh, most of the time I was also a, at a, a field called Benoit mm -hmm. uh, during that Anloc uh, right. Battle and, and we were we were brought back. Uh, I was in Thailand at the time. Our our outfit had uh, airplanes in at Da Nang in Vietnam and then uh, NKP in Thailand, Nakam Phanom. And so uh, they took us from Nakam Phanom down to Benoit outside of Saigon, and we we flew our missions out of there for eh, I don't know maybe three weeks. Wow. And uh, but it. Uh, so we went back to Saigon, and as I said, I hadn't really been there before. It was amazing. It's quite a quite a modern city. They took us and dropped us off at a shop, big modern shopping, multi-level shopping center, and uh, we wandered around the town a little bit. But there, and, and the bus took us to uh, there was a, a museum that had yeah. some uh, some of our aircraft that we had used uh, during the war. As a matter of fact, the aircraft that I flew, the AC-119. Uh, the only one left is in Vietnam, and we're trying to get it back. <laughs> so, anyhow, we're in negotiations with right. the Vietnamese. Okay, uh, we're going to continue our story anyhow. I'll we'll get more into it anyhow, but uh, hopefully we'll have Rona join us pretty soon. We're still waiting for her to join us here anyhow. But uh, stay tuned, and again, this is Hawaii Uniform, and uh, please stay tuned. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on ThinkTech Hawaii. 
Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Hey, Stan, the energy man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Okay, you're back with a white uniform. Again, I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And uh, today, one of my uh, special guests, Mr. Dan O'Leary. And um, uh, the topic we had advertised was going to be on a program about women in, in, um, in the military, uh, services past and present. And we had, a, again, another guest that was coming on, Rona Adams, who uh, hopefully will join us before the end of the program. But um, if not, you know, I'd like to remind, uh, you know, the viewers that there, I mean, as far as women in the military and serving the country, I mean, it comes in all forms and shapes and time periods. And, um, you know, you need to, we need to, you know, show our appreciation, all, you know, for that also. I may I call you Dan? Yeah. Dan, I mean, speaking of that, um, in the military, how many, uh, you serve with a lot of um, female service members. Um, any recollections on anything as far as your experiences or how, you know, things went? No. Um, we, I, being in a flying organization, women were the only flying positions that they were allowed to hold at that time were like flight attendant positions, uh -huh. but we didn't have any in the organizations that I was in. They, they felt that having females in an all-male organization wouldn't be that, especially going, we would go TDY yeah. and fly all the way over to Vietnam and back we were stationed in North Carolina. So they didn't, uh, we didn't have any women in our organizations there. Uh, and I was just a little um, early in the military before a lot of people. Now they have, you know, female fighter pilots and, and transport pilots and everything else. So they, it's, they're completely integrated now. But I, we never had any females. They just didn't allow them into pilot training or anything at the time that I was in the service. Yeah. Yeah, because even today, I think they changed certain rules as far as, uh, certain go combat MOSs that women have been allowed to, but especially with, since the Gulf War, um, you know, they've had women on the front line because the front line was all over the place, you know, yeah. and uh, a lot of them did, you didn't get proper recognition as far as their con con contributions to, you know, the military effort over there, you know, because a lot of, yeah, a few of them I've talked to, they come back and um, they go to a VFW or some other organization and it's like, well, where's your husband? You know, it's like, well, no, uh, I'm the one that served, you know? Yeah. And uh, then there was a little bit of, you know, seemed like a little bit of hesitation, you know? Uh, hopefully that's changing, but I know there's still some issues going on with that anyhow. But um, yeah, we fully need to, you know, get into it because as we say, the military is changing. There's all kind of different rules and regulations that have been relaxed, uh, different, um, identities as far as gender uh, identification, things of that nature, that still kind of throw a lot of people off because, you know, you're used to the traditional wording or certain things that went on in the past, and for new things to come about, you know, it's kind of a change and a little bit stressful some of, for some of the uh, individuals who are really um, focused on the old terminologies that you would use anyhow, so we'll see. Right. We but, had uh, a... We had a uh, a woman veteran that was at our event last week. She was helping to cook in the kitchen, but she had a shirt on and it said, I'm a veteran. Mm -hmm. My father, I'm the daughter of a veteran, mm -hmm. and my daughter is a veteran. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting when you <laughs> think about something like that. But oh, yeah, that's for sure. Well, what else have you been doing? I know you do you travel, you travel other parts of the world, or what's the latest, uh, your latest adventure? Yeah, well, uh, my wife decided that we should go on a uh, uh, photo safari. Mm -hmm. So she signed up for a, a tour, and uh, we flew down to Johannesburg, South Africa. Mm -hmm. Long flight. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we uh, spent a few days in Johannesburg. We got there a little early. We didn't want to get, we didn't want to miss our tour. So we uh, we stayed at the same hotel where the tour was staying. So they two days on our own, two days with the tour, and then off we went to Kruger National Park and then uh, Hwangi National Park. In uh, the Kruger is in uh, South Africa, and then Hwangi is in uh, uh, Zimbabwe, and then we also went out, went up to uh, Botswana, to uh, Chobe, the Chobe River, Chobe National Park, and. Uh, it just could not have been better. Uh, thank goodness these people are taking care of the animals. They set yep. up all these national parks, and you're allowed to go in there and, and view the animals and and uh, see them firsthand. Uh, only one of the parks were the were the people armed that were with us, and evidently that the animals are just more wild in that park than they are in the other parks. Yep. But. Uh, other than that, we were just out there, and we had some scary moments. Uh, we had a—it looked like there was a lion that was going to jump in our, in our truck, but she didn't. She went between the two trucks and went running down the road. She was she was looking for some lunch, but I was yeah. glad she didn't come after us. She was looking at some impala that were down the road. <laughs> but it was a scary moment for us in the two trucks because yeah. she turned toward the truck in front of us, then she turned toward our truck and started to run, mm -hmm. and and the trucks are wide open except for the the canopy. Mm -hmm. There's no windshield or anything, so she could have jumped right in right straight into the truck with us, oh. but uh, she went between the trucks and down the road. So, yeah. uh, there, but other than an anxious moment, uh, yeah. no no danger there. <laughs> okay. But it's a wonderful, wonderful trip. We had a great time and yeah. the tour guides were terrific. Yeah, it's like, uh, I think a lot of people get a misconception of Africa. There's a lot of stuff that's going on over there, but I think in a lot of parts, it's very, you know, uh, yeah, what can I say, I mean, it's, it's unique over there for one thing, anyhow. Yeah. But I think it, like getting into, you know, being in the military, having the chance to travel uh, to different parts of the world, you know, in support of whatever missions, anyhow, uh, did it give you a better appreciation of what we have here or give you a comparison? Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, I, uh, I, we used to travel regularly into uh, Iran, for uh -huh. one. Now, an American would be crazy to go traveling into Iran, I, I think, but uh, mm -hmm. we, it was one of our regular trips going into the Middle East. We'd go to Iran, down to, uh, into Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Eritrea, mm -hmm. Asmara, uh, Ethiopia, and then uh, on down to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Those, that was a regular trip. We used to do that maybe, uh, each one of us would do it either every month or every other month, mm -hmm. one of our regular missions, and we would, it would they were support. Uh, of, uh, of military operations that we had in those countries. Right. So we uh, we used to affectionately say we were carrying uh, toilet paper to the Turks, but it really, you know, <laughs> we, I was in I was in C-130s and uh, troop carrier, we yeah. called it, but it was really, we did a lot of cargo carrying, yeah. and that was our, our mission down there in the Middle East. Oh. We supplied all the embassies and consulates and all the uh, uh, sites that we had in those countries. Mm. Good. So, what, for the future, what does it look like for you? What, I mean, are you going to expand your um, involvement in the, the organization, or is there anything personally that you have planned, you know, that will benefit the uh, veterans or the military? Well, the veterans in the military, we aren't doing a lot with them. Mm -hmm. um, mostly, the, mostly the people that are out of the military, oh, yeah. and uh, like I say, so visiting them in the hospitals, having functions for them. Uh, we go out and feed the, uh, the vets. Out at uh, out at the U.S. vets, uh, you know, go out and and, uh, and provide a luncheon. So everything that we prov uh, the luncheon that we had for these fellows, we provided all the food and the drinks and everything. Uh, the uh, uh, the veterans center out out in uh, Foster Village, Foster they Village. they provided the place, they <coughs> provided the kitchen for us, they provided all the uh, plates and cups and uh, plasticware and all that stuff, right. napkins and uh, but. Uh, so we, you know, so we we chip in and, and do that as much as we as we can. So yeah. uh, uh, again, we're not uh, we don't have any big projects going on really. It's yeah. mostly smaller stuff and okay. trying to trying to take care of each other. Uh, as a lot of it, the, the monthly meetings. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of issues that uh, still need to be addressed because we, we, of course we still have the issue about homeless veterans over here. Um, also, a number of different things. You know. Um, suicides, things of that nature anyhow. But again, it seems like there's more veterans who are getting involved in trying to, you know, uh, the peer mentoring, if you want to call it, where they're trying to help one another out, you know, because there have been a lot of vets who have been disappointed by the system for whatever reason, and uh, a little shy away from, you know, any type of formal um, overtures, they might help them, you know. 
but I think there's a lot of veterans who I have, um, um, let's just say they have the, the means to help other veterans. And I think that's, you know, becoming more and more commonplace than it was so in the past, anyhow. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on or something we might have missed that? Um, well, I, I, I think you remember, or you might not remember, but you probably read about it, that a lot of the schools, they had demonstrations and problems, Kent State, et cetera. Of course, yeah. But I was, go I was sent by the Air Force back to school, and there were mm -hmm. 600 veterans going to school at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Actually, when I started in there, it was the University of Omaha, and they changed to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had uh, uh, an organization of veterans there, a uh, small group called the Pen and Sword Society, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a, an army lieutenant colonel that was our, uh, sort of our leader. And um, so the, uh, a student group approached him, and they asked him what we would do if they um, uh, barred the doors and mm -hmm. prevented all the students from going to school, yeah. they, you know, kind of a, a demonstration right. uh, at the school. <clears throat> so he said, well, he said that we were all under military orders to go to school, so mm -hmm. if we had to do that, we'd do it over their dead bodies. Yeah. So he said, why don't you just chain yourself to a tree? And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's what they ended up doing, yeah. you know, so more of a demonstration than stopping people from going to school. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, back in the 60s, it was very um, turbulent times, you know, uh, a lot of people the younger people nowadays don't really understand that there were a lot of people on both sides who were very passionate about um, a lot of issues, you know, and who were willing to pay the price, you know, whether you were pro or con, whatever, you know, but it seemed like there was more of a involvement with the citizens, or, you know, I think mainly it had to be at some point in certain ports of the country where you had to make a stand, you know, and um, I think we need to get more involved, not in the same degree as far as with the radical demonstrations and all that, but I think as citizens, we still need to go ahead and get involved, do what we can. You know, you may not agree with somebody else, but one we can thing we can do is sit down and listen to them, you know, and get a better perspective or a different perspective. You may not agree with it, but at least the dialogue is there. You know, you have that verbal contact, and you're able to be humanized instead of dehumanize someone else in the end. Okay? Okay. We're getting out to the wire, and uh, I want to thank you for coming on the program. I'm sorry that Rona couldn't join us anyhow, but I'll try to get her there, you know, a little bit later anyhow. But um, again, I want to remind you, please, um, uh, find, check out history, find out what's going on, talk to you, see any um, female service members or veterans, whatever it is. Stop and ask them how things are going or whatever, and you might learn a little bit of something more about uh, the system and our military and how those individuals who selflessly give up uh, a lot of their personal careers to do what we can to make our country better. But I want to thank you again for joining the program. Thank you, Mr. Leary, for again for joining us. Right. And the um, only thing I can say is God bless, and until that time.